From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And ahead today, K-State's Justin Wagner on cowherd water consumption in the summertime. What research says about the daily amount a cow consumes and what affects that. And why providing sufficient access to the water tank is every bit as important as the volume of water available. Then highlights from this week's Cattle Chat podcast out of the Beef Cattle Institute at K-State. On two cow-calf management topics, monitoring bull activity through the remainder of the breeding season and considerations on moving the calving season on the calendar. K-State's Brad White, Bob Weber, and Dustin Pendle checking in for that. And later on, with this week's commentary on life in rural Kansas, K-State's Gus Vanderhoeven. All that here on Agriculture Today. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State research and extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans and more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. We're glad to have you tuned in for another Agriculture Today here at Midweek. And we'll begin by talking about a topical matter in the summertime for you cow-calf producers to consider providing adequate water to the herd. Now, in times of drought, that's critical. But even in years like this, where we've had more than ample rainfall in a fair part of the state, paying attention to those water needs is equally important. And we're joined now via phone by Beef System Specialist Justin Wagner of K-State Research and Extension. He had an article on this topic in the recent Animal Sciences and Industry Newsletter out of Kansas State University. Justin, do we tend to underestimate the impact of adequate water consumption on the part of the cow herd? You know, I think we do often from time to time. We, You know, it's something we tend to take it for granted. We we ride or we walk past the, the water tank, and if the water's there and it's free-flowing and it's relatively clean, we, we you know, kind of check the box, so to speak. Uh, but there's, you know, there's really nothing worse as a, as a cattleman to come across a set of cattle and, and find the tank dry and, and a set of cows, you know, standing around it that haven't had access to water for a, for a few hours. And so there's nothing that really kind of compares to that feeling. And it often, I think, reminds us of how important water really is to those cows. This has been a subject of key importance, as noted, in the most recent years, including last year with the drought into the early and middle part of the summer. Once more, we're not in drought now, but for those who have to pump water or haul water, management is necessary here. Yes, Eric, that's that's absolutely correct. You know, there's a lot of regions of the state where we rely on groundwater and well capacities, et cetera, to make sure we've got adequate water that it is available to cattle. And, and even in some circumstances, just maybe we've done some water site development and we're, we're pumping that in out of some surface water into some sort of a tank or, or something like that, just making sure that we've actually got enough volume of water for the available for the cows that uh, we have in the pasture. Well, then, what do we know about cow water consumption and the variables that influence that consumption? Yeah, so so one of the things, I, I always like rules of thumbs just because they're, they're really a, a nice baseline. And one of the old rules of thumb when it comes to water is that the cows will typically consume or require one to two gallons per 100 pounds of body weight. And so that's, that's a pretty good rule of thumb. We'll talk more in depth as to the, into, the, into the specific of those numbers here in a minute. Um, but there's a lot of factors that play into a cow's water requirements. Body weight, uh, the salt content of the diet, moisture content of the diet as well. Um, but one of the two big drivers are really lactation potential, how much milk those cows are producing with, if they have calves aside, and their body weight, as well as the, the ambient temperature outside. 
So throw us some representative numbers to give an idea of how all of that ties together. Sure. So basically when we get to temperatures above 40 degrees Fahrenheit, cows will require an additional gallon of water for every 10 degrees increase in temperature. So let's say we have a 1,300-pound beef cow that's dry, and if it's 90 degrees outside, that cow will require around 14 gallons of water per day. Now, if we take that same 1,300-pound cow, and she's now producing 25 pounds of milk, at that same 90-degree temperature, she's going to require about 20 gallons of water per day. And so that that rule of thumb, you know, here on this 1,300-pound cow, we're talking about a range from a dry cow to a cow that's lactating of somewhere between 15 and 20 gallons of water per day. Now, those are not absolute numbers, but they're ballpark ideas of what one needs to figure as they're thinking about the volume of water that their herd has access to. Absolutely. A good general guideline, and especially, you know, there's oftentimes the things that that we take for granted that we that we just think we should know, but in all actuality, anytime we get above temperatures that are above 90 degrees, it can be very difficult to predict how much water a cow will voluntarily consume, just largely due to the increase in temperature. A lot of times what I'll tell people is you can just plan on somewhere between a 10 and a 20% increase above what that cow's requirement would be at that 90 degree temperature mark. Hmm. And that's part of the equation, you say, Justin. The other part that is equally important is access to that water. Absolutely. And, and actually, this is, this is probably one of the areas that's, that's maybe more challenging than actually the volume is, is just tank access. You know, it's, typically it's recommended that a cow have 15 inches of linear tank space per head so that at least 10% of the animals in the pasture should be able to drink from that tank at once, and that's if the distance to the tank is relatively close. So typically relatively close means within a half mile to me. In a larger pasture where cattle are traveling longer distances, um, we need to increase that linear trough space such that about 30% of the animals in the pasture can have access to the tank at once to avoid overcrowding. And so as we get into that, you know, oftentimes that can be a, a larger limiter than actually the volume of water that's in the tank. Hmm. So, you know, a standard 12-foot stock tank has about 452 linear inches of drinking space. So if we take that 15 inches per head, we've got that that tank should support a maximum of about 30 head for that 12-foot stock tank. And that's if 10% of them can can get up and drink. So that's in that situation where we're relatively close to water. But if you have a distance between the water and where the cattle are grazing or otherwise hanging out, why that 12-foot tank, as far as access goes, may not be sufficient? That's absolutely correct. So something to take into account is just how much actual trough space we have. And especially in the summertime, you know, if you do the math and figure out, given the, the stocking rate and what we may have in a given pasture, a lot of times it can be a good idea just to set an additional tank out there so that we do have adequate tank space for those cattle to be able to get up and have access to the tank. While we're talking about the tanks themselves, uh, not only access, but such seemingly simple things as providing for good footing around those tanks. So you don't have well a mud hole building up there and, and causing access issues as well. That's correct, and especially, you know, young calves. That's something we often take for granted. It's pretty easy for the soil to become eroded around tanks around a a stock water well or a windmill. And so, you know, making sure that those calves can actually get up and have access to that tank, that can be an important thing to also remind folks of. Um, You know, I also think that one of the smaller things we often take for granted is, you know, sometimes we need to pull the plug on those tanks and and flush those things out. And I know that's that's certainly not a fun job here in western Kansas. And in some cases, um, if it hasn't been a while since those tanks have been cleaned, um, that's probably a project that's going to require a scoop shovel in some instances. But, you know, it kind of goes hand-in-hand with the quality of water that, that we're providing to those cattle. 
and that's bigger than most people think about. Yeah, it's it's really one of the the basic tenets of of animal husbandry is providing animals, you know, a good, clean uh, water source. And in that, one, if they're pumping water, uh, windmill or otherwise, they might want to actually have that water tested every now and again for content. That's correct. You know, I think a lot of times uh, we overlook uh, the water quality, especially on some wells and, and maybe considering how long it's been since that water may have been tested. You know, we tend to see those, the quality of water change, um, oftentimes in wells, especially here in western Kansas. Um, as we get drier and those wells begin to, to dry down a little bit or maybe some changes in some shallower wells due to just the groundwater resource itself, can really be a good idea to, to maybe pull a water sample and, and send that in and submit that for analysis and just to see where those things are at. And in some cases, um, they can be linked to some production problems. You know, water is an excellent source of minerals that we often overlook. Both and those that can be both good or bad in some cases. So many things to contemplate here, but it comes back to the fact that uh, Justin, the cow herd, does respond to having adequate water available at a, a decent quality at minimum. And uh, when hot weather hits, and it will, those responses are quite pronounced. That's correct, Eric. So some thoughts there for you producers as you think about providing that adequate volume and access to water here as we really get into the tougher, hotter days of summer. If you'd like to know more about that gallonage required for various weights of cows, there is a chart that Justin referred to just a moment ago in this article that he has put into the Animal Sciences and Industry Newsletter out of Kansas State University. You can find that at asi.ksu.edu. By the way, might have a look, producers. We appreciate the input. Justin, many thanks. Thanks again, Eric. Justin Wagner with us, Beef Systems Specialist with K-State Research and Extension. Agriculture Today returns in a few moments on the K-State Radio Network. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128 plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. Continuing on now on Agriculture Today with more for you cow-calf producers, courtesy of the K-State researchers at the Beef Cattle Institute here on the campus. As part of their latest BCI Cattle Chat podcast, they took up a couple of timely subjects, closely monitoring bulls as the breeding season winds down, and the merits of moving one's calving season away from the traditional late winter, early spring time frame. On board this time, cow-calf specialist Bob Weber, livestock economist Dustin Pendle, and the podcast moderator, veterinarian Brad White. Bob, we were talking before we got on the air. We're in the middle, or maybe towards the end, of some of the breeding seasons. What are some of the things I should be watching for? What's on my breeding season to-do list once once the breeding season's underway and we're off and running? Yeah, Brad, I think uh, uh, this time of year, is, uh, for a lot of folks, and particularly this year, there's been you know a delayed planting, and so if you've got a diversified operation, the, the, the cows have maybe been second fiddle a lot. Um, but uh, this, this time of year is important for a, a couple of reasons. One, um, and we talked a little bit of last week about sort of monitoring uh, you know, bull performance, and so you know, making sure when we go out and check cows, we go find the bull, um, make sure we get him up, walk him around a little bit, and, you know, give him a little time to stretch if he's been laying there a while, but make sure he can get up and, and move around and everything looks normal in terms of 
uh, the health on the bull. But uh, you know, beyond that, there's some other things that we can do that, that sort of help fill us in a little bit about what's what's going on in the breeding season. One of those, um, we'll focus on continue on the bull side for just a minute, and that's a body condition score. Um, so if we're getting you know two thirds away through the breeding season, and you know our bulls you know maybe been pulled down in, in body condition score, you know into the four somewhere, it might be time to think about swapping out replacements um, and, and bringing in some some backup bull power. Just we know fertility and and literally uh, have to go to the bullpen. Yeah, That's you got to go to the bullpen exactly. You know we're in, in in deep into the into the sixth inning. Pitching might not be going great. Um, it might be you know pitch counts way over a hundred. It might well. Hopefully not 100. <laughs> For there, we got real problems. Anyway, um, you know, particularly if, if we've been using yearling bulls uh, and, and turned out one of the strategies uh, we talk about frequently is, you know, uh, uh, the number of cows equal to the age of the bull in months. So, you know, if we turned out a 14-month-old bull, we put him with 14 cows. And, you know, if, if those cows happen to be kind of spread out in, in their calving distribution, then, you know, those bulls are covering... Uh, a lot of ground for a long period of time. If they've been drawn down in body condition, you know, pulling in a fresh yearling bull to go behind and finish out the breeding season can be really valuable. Um, and I think that's... So that's, don't wait. Don't that's wait. Decision. Yeah, if, if you've got a bull that's gotten thin and you've got some yearling bulls that maybe you can turn in and, and help pick up the slack, pull the thin bulls out So because you'll have some social dominant stuff, right? Start mixing bulls, so you got to be cognizant of that. Uh, but putting some fresh horsepower in can sure help. Uh, on the cow side, one of the things I, I like to monitor this time of year is uh, a fly count, right? So we're, we've, we should, if we're feeding an, an IGR kind of product, um, we should have started that 30 days before uh, the last frost. And but keeping keeping an eye on our mineral uh, intake and make sure we're doing okay there. Uh, monitoring fly count and see if you know if we need to do some fly spray or put tags in yet. We're a little early on on most of those, but it's it's not too early to start watching. Um, the other thing is is watch estrus behavior. So um, I know uh, a lot of times it's more convenient maybe to go over the lunch hour and run out and check cows but that's actually not the best time so cows even if they are in, in standing heat in the middle part or the heat of the day won't uh, display us they won't show it and so it's better to go early in the morning or um, towards dusk in the evening spend some time if you can uh, observe the cows from a distance for a while um, before they're kind of alerted to your presence so you can kind of catch if, if there's some estrus behavior going on um, I know a lot of folks will um, you know run the cake feeder for a minute and of course all the cows run up and they're distracted by feed not estrus behavior so and the reason to do that is um, uh, to watch estrus this time of years if we have had a bull that's gone bad um, and we still see uh, a fair number of cows uh, in heat then that alerts us to that there's a potential male problem in our in our midst and we need to get that fixed and if they're not synced they're not synchronized and they're cycling cows about five percent of your cycling yep. cows should be cycling every day every day so exactly. if you go out there and you look at them and you've got a handful of cows that you see cycling in a single day, and I've got a hundred cows out there. That means most of them are not bred. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd be actually this. If you know, if you're well into the the breeding season and you've still got five percent cows cycling, uh, that's a big red flag. There's something something wrong because we should have caught most of the, particularly the early calvers, and start weeding that number off as we go along. So that's a, a big red flag for uh, problems uh, on the horizon. So, so and, and I think we'll, I want to pick up on one more thing that you said was observe from a distance and observe early morning or in the evening yep. and plan on, so I've, I find myself in the trap of I'm doing my job and getting out of there. This is not one of those that you do quick and you go. This is a take a cup of coffee yep. um, and enjoy the sunrise and watch your cows in your dominion. Right? It can be actually really good both yep. mental health time. Right? Because you yep. kind of plan the day. You know, you're watching cows, drinking a little coffee. It can be the best part of your day. You just got to make a habit of doing it. Or or in the evening, you can choose another refreshing another beverage refreshing beverage choice. is okay as well. Yep. <laughs> That's exactly right. So. We get this question frequently about moving the calving season. Let's talk a little bit about that. What are the things that I should think about, consider? Well, I think one of the um, um, the, the really key things is, one, first understand, maybe kind of retrospectively, why are you calving when you're calving, right? So um, at some point in time, somebody made a conscious decision in your cow herd to calve at a certain period of time, and uh, that, that kind of... 
uh, retrospective uh, or institutional knowledge can be be valuable and maybe prevent you from repeating mistakes of the past. But um, lots of motivators this spring with the long winter and uh, lots of mud and cold weather to uh, think about certainly potentially a shift either to a fall calving system or at least later in the spring early summer so and I think that's I think that's been a consideration why we see that question and there are market implications so if I'm spring calver I'm selling my calves when most everybody's selling their calves in the fall if I'm a fall calver may have a better market but I've got some higher feed costs what, what do you think from yeah that? no absolutely if you're thinking about moving that that's the one thing is think about the financial side uh, you the marketing aspect of it you you hit the cost as well i mean thinking about cash flow uh, i mean those are all things that you have to think through uh, that are essential when yeah. possibly going from a fall to a spring or spring to a fall so maybe instead of let me let me reframe this question let's take it from instead of me moving if i'm going to pick an ideal calving time there's a lot of implications economic and production what are some of the things that you guys would consider if you if I'm starting a herd and saying when should I calve? Yeah, so I, Brad, I actually look, like to look at it um, both what's sort of the ideal calving time, um, and that comes I think both from you know a calf survival and calf calving management, so the calving season part, but also that postpartum nutrient environment that our hopefully native range is providing or our improved pastures um, so those cows can consume most of the nutrient requirement they have running up to peak lactation and through breeding season so i think that that parts and you know for a lot of folks here in, in in kansas getting that aligned with a you know if you've got some warm season grass can be a really valuable way to decrease supplemental feed costs because you've moved cows from instead of being hay fed for most of that period of time uh, onto a pasture feeding kind of Because that's their highest period of nutrient consumption. Exactly. So if, if we can get it from the pasture, it'd be great. And here we're talking about warm season grasses, but if you move out of our part of the country and go even a little bit east or southeast, you get a lot more cool season grasses. Yep. So, you, so you could be earlier in the year with the calving season with the same goal. So yep. matching those cows to the environment. Yep. Or if you've got the ability to, to generate and, and make some cool season pastures um, uh, or winter annuals to, to kind of bridge that um, period of time, that can be a really advantageous structure to, to use as well. Great place to calve. And what about the labor availability? I mean, what if your job keeps you pretty much gone during the fall but you're around spring so i guess what i'm thinking is it's probably going to be each individual operation specific what works best maybe it's location is part of it but availability as well well and the feed staff availability plays into as we were just talking fall versus spring calving you hit two different marketing windows and a big offset is how much does it cost me to feed them over the winter correct if i'm in a part of the country where i could actually do that on standing forages for a lot of the winter fall calving might make a lot of sense yeah yeah especially you know south southeast um use winter and you know ryegrass and, and those kind of annual um cropping systems to generate pasture for for cows to graze can be very profitable you know? and, and one of the things i hear you saying is the more that they graze typically the less cost I've got in it because I'm not harvesting it, storing it, doing right. some of those things. So yeah. the and more I'm getting really grades yeah. and the quality's good. Yeah. Brad, the other thing I like folks to think about is sort of sort of work calving season forward and what's it look like from the cow's nutrient availability and matching peak forage quality to peak lactation. The other thing I like folks to do is go, okay, if I could sell my calves any time of the year, when do I do that? And then sort of work backwards and see if those two kind of line up. If they don't, we've got to start making compromises, right? So kind of work from one end to the other, both directions, and see where the, the problem points might be as we sort out the logic of, of when's the right time to calve and when's the right time to sell. K-State's Brad White, Bob Whipper, and Dustin Pindle. Once more, the entire podcast can be found at beefcattleinstitute.org. That's beefcattleinstitute.org. You're tuned to Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension.
you're tuned into Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network. Eric Atkinson with you. And now to today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. And we'll begin with an item on the local front. The College of Agriculture at Kansas State University has named its new dean, who is a familiar figure. Following a national search, Ernie Minton has been named to the post. Ernie's been serving as the interim dean of the college over the past year. His appointment was made by the university provost and executive vice president, Charles Tabor. Ernie's been serving as the interim college dean and director of K-State Research and Extension since July 1 of last year. Under his leadership, the college reached its innovation and inspiration campaign goal of $120 million earlier this year. He has also led the college college-level planning for major infrastructure improvements and renovations to key college facilities. And there are many plans to modernize facilities, including the Dairy Teaching and Research Facility, among other projects. Before his appointment as interim dean, Ernie served as the college's associate dean of research and graduate programs. And prior to that, he was a professor of animal sciences and a member of the K-State faculty since 1983. Ernie has his bachelor's degree in agriculture from Western Kentucky University and a master's degree in animal science, as well as a doctorate in animal reproduction, both of those from Oklahoma State University. So once again, the new dean of the College of Agriculture at Kansas State University formally announced yesterday, Ernie Minton. U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer told senators yesterday that it will take more time working with House Speaker Nancy Pelosi before the Trump administration can submit the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement to Congress for ratification. Lighthizer testified to the Senate Finance Committee, acknowledging that the House needs to take leadership in ratifying the agreement. Lighthizer said he has worked extensively with Pelosi to address concerns over environmental and labor standards, as well as enforcement of the new trade deal. Pelosi said Lighthizer has been completely fair and above board in his words. He says that they uh, think they're making progress and quoting him again, my hope over the next couple of weeks, we will make substantial progress. Here's more on this from the USDA's Gary Crawford. What part of the USMCA, the U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade deal now awaiting congressional approval, seems to concern lawmakers the most? Well, at a Senate Finance Committee hearing this week, the main issue mentioned there... Enforcement. Real enforcement. Enforcement. Meaningful enforcement. Stronger enforcement. 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 That seems to be the major issue for lawmakers. U.S. Chief Negotiator Ambassador Robert Lighthizer told the panel that not only are there dispute settlement mechanisms in the agreement... But also what we did in this agreement, which I think think is far more helpful is we made the obligations very, very specific. The more general the obligations are, the harder they are really to enforce. So we were far more specific than a lot of these agreements in the past so that we can precisely say whether or not someone is following it. Lighthizer also said he's willing to work with lawmakers to further ramp up some of the enforcement and dispute settlement provisions in the deal. Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Washington. Now, last week, 950 groups signed on to a letter to congressional leaders calling on Congress to ratify the USMCA. Lighthizer said the new trade deal is remarkably better for agriculture, even though agriculture did relatively well under the old NAFTA. He cited wheat standards and dairy provisions affecting trade with Canada. Canada, as well as language on geographical indicators and rules on biotechnology as all being beneficial to agriculture. He added nearly everyone wanted to see changes related to dairy trade. He did not have a specific time frame for when the USMCA would be submitted to Congress. The schedule set forth in law states that trade agreements must be introduced at least 30 days before Congress begins formal hearings and committee action. Thus, the window for Congress passing the USMCA this summer is becoming smaller. Now, on a call with reporters yesterday, Senate Finance Committee Chairman Charles Grassley also defended Pelosi on the trade deal, saying she has a lot of freshman members who are not educated on the complexities of a trade deal. 
On other topics before that Senate Finance Committee, Lighthizer said he's unsure if the tariffs will lead to Chinese trade reforms, but dialogue alone did not prove successful, he said. The ambassador also acknowledged U.S. agriculture is losing market share in Japan because of other trade agreements, but that trade talks with Japan are making progress. He said the biggest single issue that is troubling on that front in the short run is the hit to our farmers because the Japanese have made agreements with Canada. Canada and New Zealand under the Trans-Pacific Partnership, as well as Japan's trade agreement with Europe. And just before the hearing began yesterday, President Trump tweeted that he would meet with Chinese President Xi Jinping next week. Lighthizer said the U.S. is preparing to move ahead with more tariffs on Chinese goods. The trade representative holding hearings this week with businesses testifying on the impacts there. Well, one expert says some of us may misinterpret the planting percentages in the USDA's crop progress reports that come out weekly. Again, Gary Crawford. This week's USDA crop progress report shows that as of this past Sunday, most farmers were still behind normal getting things planted. It showed they had planted 92% of the corn crop, then soybeans 77%, but for example, rice 100%. But Lance Honig with the USDA Statistics Service told us we have to be careful how we interpret those percentages. They represent the portion of the crop that's planted relative to the intentions as of that week. Not as of March planting intentions, not as of what farmers thought they were going to try to plant at the start of the planting season. So for beans, for example, report shows 77% planted. That's 77% of what growers as of Sunday intended to try to plant. If you take that a step further, what that means is we will get to 100% planted. That does not mean that farmers planted everything that they hoped to. But let's face it, farmers will have to stop planting at some point, and at that point, progress will show 100%. And we'll know more about actual acres planted with USDA's acreage report coming June 28th. Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Washington. And lastly, in the headlines today, President Trump directed EPA Administrator Andrew Wheeler and USDA Secretary Sonny Perdue to come up with a new plan relative to ethanol. As they returned with the president on Air Force One from a visit to Iowa last week, this according to the Wall Street Journal, the report said the president was surprised the expansion of ethanol sales year-round has not satisfied farmers. The steps under consideration, according to the report, are not necessarily new. A, a limit on the use of small refiner exemptions from renewable fuel standard obligations. Farmers told the president at the Iowa stop that the year-round sales of E15 were not a big boost since those exemptions continue to be granted. Uh, reports this week indicated a plan to temper the SR was presented to the White House in 2018, but was not pursued. Well, a first on this broadcast, Gus Vanderhoven sings. Thankfully, for only a short time. Stop, look, and listen next on Agriculture Today. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. This is Agriculture Today. Stop, look, and listen. When I shared this with friends, one said with a laugh, because God willed it that way. That's Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with comment on life in rural Kansas. Sitting on the deck early in the morning as the sun was peeping over the roof, and lighting up the tree bark of several different trees growing in front of us, my wife asked me a question, which reminded me of a song, a children's song. The song went like this in Dutch. Waarom is de aarde rond, pa? Waarom is he niet vierkant? Waarom gaat de zee niet verder? Dan precies tot aan het strand. Okay, that's enough. But translated, it says, Why is the earth round, Dad? 
Why is the earth not square? Why does the ocean roll not further than exactly to the beach? The question Anak asked was, Why do trees have different bark? She did not ask, Why do trees have bark? No, why different bark? When I shared that with friends, one said with a laugh, Because God willed it that way. A beautiful answer but I won't settle for that. If you just look around, you quickly notice that fact that trees have different bark. Just sitting on the deck, we see the locust tree with its very flaky bark, like roof shingles in front of us. To the left, there stands a big bur oak with its very rough bark. There are golden rain trees with much smoother bark, as well as the red bud. Then there are the many cedars with the threaded bark. Birds pull threads off to use as nesting material. So the question, why do trees have different bark, is a good one. She should have also asked, why do different trees have different leaves? The question, why do trees have bark, is simple to answer. The bark is to protect the tree just like we have skin. The internal bark has the function to transport nutrients and conserve water. Bark also protects from temperature extremes. We know that smooth bark trees, when placed under temperature stress of a sudden temperature drop in the winter, can split, often on the west side. You can see it in the long scars of a split but healed bark of a wrongly placed tree. The bark of the bur oak, rough as it is, does not split readily. It's a bark which can withstand quick passing prairie fires. It is adapted. The beech tree has a much smoother bark and grows much slower than the bur oak bark. Being smoother to the touch, it may be more resistant to insect attack. Looking at the locust, which has a flaky bark, I have watched the woodpeckers and other insect-eating birds do their shopping, their feeding. Some only move up the trunk. Others go up and down, turning their heads to take a look and a quick peck, and they got what they looked for, a meal. So, bark is a defense. Bark can taste bad to animals to discourage stripping. But it does still not answer the question, why different bark? God willed it that way is an answer. But I see it more in the science, as bark development over the millions of years, with bark for the different trees developing and providing survival of the fittest, and it becoming the tree we know today. As I'm thinking about it, I see the beautiful London plane trees here on campus, with their glorious white, smooth bark. They have huge, low-spreading branches reaching out like ghosts, on a moonlit night. I always wonder what blind people see. I know that touch for them is seeing. The next time you walk in the city park, stand among the trees and close your eyes and reach out with your hand to touch the bark of different trees. Really notice the difference and let it sink in. And even if we don't know why the difference... Enjoy the beauty of bark. The bark of the persimmon tree appears as small square blocks. The bark of the shag bark hickory is like the name implies, shaggy. When you walk with children, show the difference to them. Start making them observant. Children learn so easily when young. Teach them to be inquisitive and hope and pray that schooling does not disappoint them. I have a friend who as a teenager was given a handful of bulbs, small bulbs, and was told to grow them. It started a lifelong fascination with bulbs and plants. 
He made horticulture his career, a great teacher, and stimulating to his students. The point for me is, I do not need to know all the answers as long as I'm thinking about it. Then as you think, you will start to see answers, or sometimes not, and even the not can be an answer. So why do trees have bark? It is for protection. Why do trees have different bark? That I see as adaptation and survival of the fittest with the best bark for each species to survive. I'm glad that the young and mighty bur oak can withstand the quick prairie fire and hence survive. The outer bark is renewed from within. The outer bark splits when growth is too tight, like a bad-fitting shoe. The tight bark splits and cracks in the pattern distinct for the particular tree species. For some species, bark peels and flakes off again and again, revealing the smooth, clean, new bark. Just keep asking. Keep wondering. Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with his weekly commentary on life in rural Kansas. That's our time for today. As always, thanks for tuning in. Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.